Hi, I'm Ruth McCambridge, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Nonprofit Quarterly. And I'm thrilled today to um, welcome our panel, um, who are going to talk about a really um, a great new report that is very much in the tradition of the reports that have been previously released by that wonderful combination of Compass Point and Haas Junior Fund, which funds these kinds of things, and in this case, uh, Kim Klein, who's a co-author of the report. Um, she is with Klein and Ross and Roth. Um, this report really reflects a it reflects a particular kind of research that comes right out of the experiences of the field and it may feel extremely resonant for all of you. Um, the, the trick is, I think, in some cases, is to value your own understanding of things over what you've been told to do, over the normative information that you may have been getting. And so in that way, this is just, a, 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 I think you're, you're going to find this really accurate to what some of your experiences will have been in your own organizations. Um, I want to welcome all of the participants, and there will be a lot today, um, and, I, and thank the sponsor. This, this webinar is brought to you free today um, as a result of a sponsor paying for the event, and that sponsor today is Kindful, which is a modern CRM platform dedicated to helping nonprofits build long-lasting donor relationships. Their integrated software helps you organize your data and, and keep it fresh. They track all of your important fundraising activities and help guide better decisions with smart re reporting. Um, I do want to say before we go on that um, it is uh, we will be sending you the slides, the, the recording, everything from this webinar within 48 hours after we conclude today. And so you don't need to ask me that question again. <laughs> um, I've already got like four or five people who've asked me that question. You will get it within 48 hours. Um, and also, the last 20 minutes of this webinar is going to be dedicated to your own question. So you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen a, a place to log in your questions. Uh, feel free to do that whenever anything strikes you. Um, if it's no longer applicable at the time that we actually go to questions because somebody's already answered it, I'll just skip it and go on to another one. But feel free to just log those in as we go along. Um, I think now I'd like to hand this over to Jean Bell. Jean is from Compass Point Nonprofit Services. It's a remarkable capacity building organization in California. Um, but it's really well known as one of the premier, if not the premier, capacity building organization in the country. Um, we're also going to welcome today Ari Wolf Wolfiler, who's with Jewish Voice for Peace, and Melinda Wiggins, who's with Student Action with Farm Workers. And so thank you all for being here, and I'm going to hand this over to Jean. Thank you so much, Ruth. I appreciate that. Um, and hello to everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, first thing I want to say is it's always a relief when Ruth uh, thinks something is decent. That means we've done a, a good job, and we're so grateful uh, for the Quarterly's partnership in sharing this research with the field. Um, and I also want to, as you did, Ruth, call out the particular role that the Haas Junior Fund plays in signaling the, important, the importance of researching and investing in nonprofit leadership and capacity building, uh, particularly for social change organizations, but relevant to the field at large. And it was their idea uh, to do this report this way. We had done underdeveloped a couple of years ago, and many of you saw that report. Um, and that report hit a nerve with the field, uh, primarily because it described the problem really well, uh, some of the chronic problems that many groups, not all groups, thank gosh, but many groups face around fundraising. Um, and so this, this approach is really different and really exciting to us, which was 
okay, there's a lot of groups struggling with this, but there are also groups that are really succeeding, and how do we, how do we learn from them? And particularly, how do we learn from groups that don't have some particular special access to resources? Or uh, these are very re quote regular groups. Um, they're very important, but they're very regular groups, and we wanted to see how they do it. Um, so that's what this, this study is about. Unfortunately, Kim Klein couldn't be here with us today, but Kim and her partner at Klein and Roth, Stephanie Roth, were uh, key partners, researchers, writers of this report as well. So a shout out to them. And you see our uh, Twitter handles at the bottom of every slide. Uh, the hashtag for all of this work that Haas Jr. has set up is Reset Development. There are other pieces. There's a wonderful piece by Cindy Gibson also on the Haas Jr. website that you can look at uh, that complements this piece that's all about the culture of philanthropy. And uh, you have Kim and mine and the Haas Jr. Fund handles there at the bottom as well. So. Let me just quickly remind us um, from underdeveloped, among the findings uh, that that report lifted up was this, this sort of degree of the development director position being a revolving door position, all the ramifications of that, um, and, and how long the vacancies were, how non-attached to their organizations or even to development, many of the development directors and development staff that we surveyed were. Um, and we ended up naming that bigger than just a revolving door, but talking about it as a vicious cycle, that, that that revolving door is part of a larger set of conditions that a lot of groups struggle with, which is this inability to kind of build the program, right? Really build the program and nurture the program and to see it as an everyday program. And when I say program, I mean the program of raising money with individuals specifically. And that inability to develop that and those lack of success conditions, lack of executive investment, lack of board clarity, lack of the rest of the staff really understanding the role of individual fundraising, indeed does spur many uh, development directors to get frustrated and burned out and to leave for, for some valid reasons. But then again, that short tenure and volatility, again, feeds into this cycle of not being able to get the success conditions in place. So that's, that's what the report was about. And this report is, is about listening to groups who aren't caught in that vicious cycle. Um, they are not, like any organization, they are not quote unquote perfect organizations. <laughs> That's not the point. Um, what we saw though in studying 16 groups that are not caught in that vicious cycle, we ended up seeing some very powerful cross-cutting themes uh, about them about their relationship to individual fundraising, about their relationships with one another, and how that program sits centrally in their organization. So the process here was to do in-depth interviews with, I call them sort of system interviews, where we had five, six, seven, eight people from each organization being interviewed. So we're really triangulating from staff, board, uh, volunteers or members are a very big part of many of these groups, and, and, and donors as well. Um, and together, these groups who are not terribly large for the most part um, raised over $14 million from individuals just in 2014, 2015. Um, and as I said, they are regular groups. <laughs> um, what the, the idea of sort of positive deviance, that they don't have anything extra special, at least on paper. Uh, they do have some special things, but those things are more about culture and practice and habit, and we'll, we'll get into that some more. Um, if you haven't seen the report yet, um, there's the link. And if you want to pull that up or, or look at it too, or please feel free to do that after, after we're done. So that's a little bit about the research. Ruth, is there anything you wanted to say before I go into the interviews here about the research itself? I'll take that as a no. Ruth, I believe um, you're self-muted, uh, so if you just click over the audio icon, you can unmute yourself. Okay, so I'm going to go into the four key themes. And again, we, we didn't go into this. Um, we, we, when we came out of underdeveloped, there was a lot of discussion going on, and there still is in the field about the notion of a culture of philanthropy. And is that what these groups who are, quote, underdeveloped were lacking? And what are the tenets of a culture of philanthropy? We intentionally did not set out on this in this particular piece uh, to try to, quote, prove the culture of philanthropy. And indeed, we didn't use that language in our interviews, and most of our groups some of them do, but most of them did not use it back to us. 
Um, but in fact, by the definitions that are circulating in the field, they, these organizations do have a lot of those tenants. Um, but we decided to describe it around these four themes that were really consistent across very diverse organizations, ge geographically, size, issue area, et cetera. And the first one is this idea that fundraising is really core to the organization's identity, and in particular, fundraising from individuals. Even if fundraising from individuals was not the largest kind of income stream for the organization, it was still core to how they saw themselves. It was still a key part of them being uh, an engagement kind of a platform organization. Very much seeing individual donors as part of a movement building strategy, um, part of the way they're in relationship with their community. Again, for some groups, they got the vast majority of their, their money from individuals. For some, it fit into a, a more diverse business model in terms of streams. But their approach to fundraising, their philosophy about it, how central it was to the way they engage with their community was consistent across the groups. Um, and this is a quote from one of, our, one of the Bright Spots executive directors, and this was a big theme in the report, where they're really saying it's not about pleasing everybody. Um, it's about knowing your core identity. And some donors are, in fact, not right for our organizations. We're not trying to bring every single person into the organization. We actually have a point of view and a core identity. And we're honest about that core identity. And we go out and try to find people who share those values and want to be part of this over the long haul. And what we've done here with each of these four themes is we also named some mindsets. These were mindsets that were prevalent across the development staff, if they had development staff, the executive, the board, the donors. Um, and these include, for the, in this area, that the decision to raise money, as well as the approaches to raising money from individuals, are really steeped in existing organizational values and identity. As I said, being genuine about who you are and what you stand for as an organization is core to the success. I would say that none of these organizations is neutral. Um, some of them very non-neutral, and that that's actually an advantage in their fundraising. They're not trying to water that down. They're trying to sharpen that message and, again, find the people who, who share those values. And for many of these groups, fundraising is a form of organizing and power building. It's not merely a financial strategy. Let me share. The second piece is that fundraising is distrib distributed broadly across staff, board, and volunteers, and in some cases, extremely broadly. Um, so lots of volunteers, not just board members. One of the things that we took away from these groups is that the board is very important, but it is not necessarily the center of gravity in, in individual fundraising. They, the board members are not seen as the only people with the responsibility or the capacity to raise money from individuals. So in fact, they're modeling and they're participating, but so are, so are other staff, so are bo volunteers, so are former board members, so are members. And that, I, from my perspective, that took a little bit of the pressure off that one locus of is the board raising money, and yes, they, these these staff work hard to get their boards to participate, but that's not the only um, avenue for engaging people in fundraising, and, and that seems very healthy across these organizations. Um, and this is, a, this is a quote organization that works with um, LGBTQ youth of color on the East Coast and talking about the fact that the kind of fundraising we're talking about, while it certainly benefits from professional support and training, everybody can be part of this. And there's a resourcefulness in communities if they're really, really aligned around the mission and identity of the organization. So the mindsets that go here about this distribution is that fundraising is not the purview of a select group of professionals. It's actually a process. Fundraising is a process, not a person. And so those people on staff or our board can really support others to engage in that. And I don't want to make that sound like that's not a ton of work, and we're going to hear from Ari and Melinda in a minute, two of our Bright Spots leaders, about how much work that is. But it's a different kind of work than thinking only one or two people are responsible for raising the money or six or seven board members. It's, it's much more distributed in these organizations. Therefore, development directors are organizational leaders. They're really, really focused on skill building, culture change, systems development to enable other people to fundraise. And also, therefore, the conversation about fundraising is very much a horizontal conversation. It belongs in every meeting. Um, it's very tied to communications. It's tied to the full staff metrics. It's not only a, a vertical or niched out part of the organization. The third finding is that fundraising succeeds because of authentic relationships with donors. That's not news. But I think the part of this that was news and that was contrary to what we saw in Underdeveloped was those authentic relationships with donors are actually built on strong, trusting relationships among staff, board, and volunteers. So we don't see here the finger pointing, the why, why won't my board do this, 
why didn't the development director bring her Rolodex like she would like, like we thought she was going to? You don't see that finger pointing. You see a lot of accountability, definitely accountability and, and frank conversation, but people are on the same team. Um, and, and this is a quote from um, NCLR, National Center for Lesbian Rights, from one of their donors, former board member, donor now, um, who talks about the authentic way that people come into that organization and stay in relationship with her even after she's left the board. And she's not looking for an army of professionals. She's looking for people from that community who are as devoted to that issue as she is. And that's the kind of relationship she has with the development staff, with board, et cetera. The mindset here um, is donor is only one aspect of the many relationships that supporters forge with an organization as volunteer, as member, as board member, as former staff, et cetera. That these authentic relationships are part of a larger organizational culture that's quite relational as opposed to transactional. And I want to keep underscoring not just with donors but with each other. So high trust and accountability among staff and board members, that, that allows these leaders to weather the inevitable ups and downs of fundraising together, to, to own their mistakes, to, to weather the hard times, and stay in it for the long haul. And fourth, that fundraising is, of course, characterized by a systematic approach to donor engagement and continuous improvement. Um, and this is actually a quote from Ari, who, who's going to speak in a minute, um, about uh, this point about, of course, there are metrics and targets and, and things like that, but this is much more than a development plan or a single annual plan. It's really a system, right, an enterprise-wide system that these groups are using. Some of the mindsets here are, in fact, more, than, more important than having a really perfect system where all the bells and whistles is the stance of rigor and continuous improvement. These groups use the tools at their disposal to really track their progress to figure out what donors are asking for. Um, and, and they really work hard at that. But that's not about big fancy systems. It's about rigor. Um, development and communications are inextricably, inextricably linked and more so than ever today. Uh, many of these groups work on issues that are changing every day in the media. So compelling communications are really a powerful way to inquire, engage, and retain donors. And finally, the use of data is not just about having a donor database. It's also about surveying donors, getting feedback from fundraisers on what messages are resonating, and studying the performance, as I said, of every campaign and event. So those are the, the key findings of the report. And now I want to uh, turn to two of our Bright Spots leaders that, that Ruth um, introduced briefly. Uh, Melinda Wiggins from Student Action with Farm Workers and Ari Wolfiler with Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, Melinda, do you want to start by telling us a little bit about the work that your organization does? Um, sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. i um, really excited about the report and what it lifts up. It sort of is a vote of confidence for what we're, we're doing. Um, student Action with Farm Workers um, tries to get young people involved with the farm worker movement. And we do this mostly by um, providing opportunities for them to immerse themselves in the movement. By in actions, by doing internships, by volunteering with organizations, and then take back what they learn with us to their communities, to their families, to raise awareness about the contributions that workers make and the things that we need to change um, for farm workers in our communities. Most of the young people we work with are from farm worker families, so they have a unique perspective on what needs to change uh, really to make our agricultural system just. Great, thank you. And Ari, do you want to introduce what your organization does? Yeah, hi. So Jewish Voice for Peace is a national membership organization working for a just peace in Israel-Palestine. So we work within the Jewish community in the United States um, to challenge the red lines around even uh, conversations in our community about Israeli policies towards Palestinians and the, den the denial of human rights to Palestinians. And we lead uh, creative, nonviolent uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns to try to change the balance of power um, in the United States um, and encourage a shift in U.S. policy uh, to actually create the conditions for people who live in Israel-Palestine to, to forge a lasting resolution amongst themselves. Great. Thank you both. And so these are two of the 16 groups that we studied. So we had the chance to talk with these leaders at length, with their donors, with board members, with fellow staff. And so I'm going to ask you guys some questions, since I know a little bit about your narrative, to, to get at some of the things that we thought uh, really were bright about the, uh, your approach to fundraising. So Melinda, um, one of the things that we talk a lot about in, in, in your organization is your choice over the years um, to essentially function as a development director, to, to not hire a development director. Can you speak a little bit 
to that and, and why that's been the right approach for you? Yeah, and I guess to start, I feel like I've had different pressures over the year to hire a development director. I would, you know, all kinds of things from other nonprofits, from board members, from, uh, you know, articles about what we should do. It seemed like what I was hearing is that once your organization reaches a certain size and budget or had a certain number of staff or was going to fundraise in a certain way, that it was imperative that you hire a development director to do that. Um, but it was my understanding that the work that the development director would do was really based on things that I enjoy doing, first of all. Um, and I think just the idea of segregating the development work into one person did not really um, align with the way that we worked as an organization, um, especially with fundraising. It's really integrated within the organization, within our interns, within our students, within our youth, within board, staff. Everyone has a role to play in fundraising. So I was worried that hiring someone um, perhaps that, that didn't know as much about the organization but had, quote, development expertise would not be a way to share the message of our work. That I was worried that person wouldn't have the passion for the work or really understand the mission and that it would segregate fundraising um, into too much, that it would really become this solo work. Um, so yeah, and again, I, I think we, you know, we do mission-based fundraising, values-based fundraising, and one of our primary uh, values is about relationships. Um, I think the report may speak to this. I've been here a long time, so I have a, a lot of relationships that I've built over the years, and it seems pretty natural to communicate with our partners and board and donors about giving um, instead of right. segregating that work. Yeah. Um, Ari, I noticed that since the report actually came out, your title has changed as well. Is that right? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's in some ways a similar story to Melinda's. We have had a development director for, I think, about two of our 20 years. Um, and so we, we, those two years just passed. Um, and I think, you know, we see fundraising and, and growing our capacity as a central political priority for JVP right now. Um, I think that we really see from our field team, from our communications teams, from our allies that uh, we're, we're in a position of playing catch-up um, with the capacity and interest that is out there to get involved, right? So the, the, um, our, our stance is towards trying to provide enough staff support and enough programmatic support to even plug people in at the levels they've already identified, right? The number of people who want to start chapters, the number of people coming to us with campaign ideas, the number of reporters asking for stories, like we're, we're not banging down doors to try to get people involved. We're trying to keep up with, with our base and with our allies. So. So I think from that vantage point, it, um, it both makes sense to, to hold the development perspective as um, centrally as possible, right? Again, it's, it's you know, up there with winning XYZ campaign or, you know, helping this number of chapters get to the next level of sophistication um, is actually building our budget um, and, and building that capacity. Um, and I also think not having a development director has allowed us to decentralize and really um, build trust with individual staff members and smaller teams to take on whole chunks of work, right? We can, we can trust our design strategist to handle the newsletter and he can figure that out and we can talk, he can talk directly to the field team about what should go into it, right? We can trust our, you know, development associate to really make strong decisions about who major donors should be connected with. So I think it also actually forces uh, a greater number of decision makers in the organization to take meaningful responsibility um, for where to take these relationships and what stories to tell. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I will say for those of you on the call, there are some development directors in this report, so don't feel <laughs> these two organizations. But I think that they're, they're not as many as you'd think, um, and they don't necessarily have the background that you'd think. Uh, and so I think a big takeaway from this report is what is a development director in a social change organization that wants to distribute decision-making leadership both inside its organization but across its stakeholder stakeholder group. So, um, and on that point, um, one of the things you do, Melinda, really successfully, and we got to interview some of these people, is you engage young people in fundraising. Uh, briefly, why do you do that, and what what does it require? Yeah, well, you know, we see ourselves as training young people to be leaders in the movement for social change for farm workers, and for us, that involves the, a holistic approach of 
how young people can make change. And again, because we have an integrated approach of fundraising is a very important role in terms of our overall advocacy work, and it's also um, a really important way for people to be a part of the movement who can't do other roles that we feel like young people need, need to know that piece of the work. We also believe that anyone can fundraise, and we're a small organization, limited staff, but we have a lot of students. We work with 50 young people very deeply every year. So with an eight-person staff, you add 50 people, it increases our capacity, you know, by a lot. And so we train young people in grassroots fundraising. We mostly over, I guess it's been about six or seven years now, have moved to an online fundraising platform for that. It used to be we trained them on writing letters and sending letters to their professors and family, but now it's, you know, communicating that online through social media mostly. So we train, we recruit the students. If every student who participates in one of our programs, fundraising is a part of it, we train them and support them to be successful. So we do a crash course in grassroots fundraising. We give them tips. We give them like the secrets, like this is really how it works. Here's how to run a one-week campaign. Um, yes, you have to send people an email every single day. You're not bugging people. You know, we give them very practical suggestions and um, support them to be successful in that. Um, I think the main reason we do it is to, because that's 50 more people who can tell our story for us. And as I said, most of the young people who work with us are from farm worker families, so who better to tell our story than a young person who grew up with their parents working in the fields or them working in the fields themselves to say, hey, I'm going to do this internship with Student Action with Farm Workers. My parents are working in the fields. I want to make a difference for my community. Here's who I am. Support SAF's work to give this opportunity to others. So really, they're the best spokespersons for our organization, yeah. and they reach you know, hundreds of new people for us every year. Thank you. Um, and Ari, at JVP, there's also, in, in a different way, um, a very kind of well-structured distributed fundraising approach. Can you tell us a little bit about where your portfolio program is and why you do it that way? Yeah, so about um, just over 90% of our income overall comes from individuals, and within that, about 50% of the income comes from major donors. Uh, so we have a team of, at this point, 60 people. Uh, it includes all staff and board are required to participate, and then about a third of it is, is made up of volunteers um, who maintain portfolios of between five and 40 major donors. Um, so really a huge portion of the work of the fundraising team here is facilitating those relationships. Um, and we, we really believe that we have sort of three goals from the fundraising side uh, in, in making that happen. And the first is to make sure that we're connecting people um, with donors, with members in the organization who they should be in contact with anyways, right? So again, if it's, you know, talking to our campus organizer about who his portfolio is going to include, well, it should probably include some professors or it should probably include somebody who got in touch with us because his daughter is active in a JVP campus chapter. Um, the second thing is making sure people feel empowered and have the actual technical skills and knowledge to be real ambassadors of Jewish Voice for Peace, right? So that they can not only, you know, explain what our pitch is this spring, but actually be a meaningful conduit for um, input and decision making, right? So if a donor says, hey, I love the way you do this or I hate the way that you do that, that information can actually go somewhere, right? And there can be um, real communication. And when you talk to one of the, the members of our solicitor team, you're actually talking to a leader in the organization and, and we're making that real. Um, so that means that actually the third part, the majority of our, of our work is actually to, to make, um, to do as much of it as possible for our solicitors, right? So to load the notes, to remind them who their people are, to like, offer opportunities where, hey, you have a donor who loves media work. We were just in the LA Times or, or whatever it is, right? To, to do as much of the thinking and logistical work as possible within the fundraising team so that the solicitors can really stay grounded in who is this person, why do I like them, what do I wish I liked about them, what am I asking them for, where, where do I want to take this relationship, right? So we can, we can remove the, the procrastination and anxiety and logistical work that comes along with major donor um, fundraising, I think especially for volunteers. Um, and really allow people to, to sink into the, the heart of those, of those um, in many cases, those real friendships. Yeah. I'm curious about, I'm sure there's people kind of like, wow, all staff participate, not just the fundraising staff. And, and has that always been true? And are there any 
things, anything you can share about how you sustain that level of commit, commitment from staff who have other jobs? I, you know, I, th I think the answer to that question really requires backing up a, a little bit to talk a, a, about the specifics of, of our issue that we work on. And I think it, there's parallels, obviously, um, across the social justice sector. But, you know, I think especially people who come to JVP with deep ties in the Jewish community, they're, they're coming often with a real history of having raised money on the other side of this issue, right? Um, fundraising is extremely, extremely important to our opposition. Um, so I think that actually people find it really um, redemptive, really liberating, really motivating, really beautiful to actually be able to raise money for what they, they believe in, right? And to actually be able to raise money to have conversations about Palestinian human rights and um, be able to, to see in their own lives a reversal maybe of what their grandparents or their parents or themselves 10 years ago were doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a real foundational um, respect for the power of fundraising in this issue that our people come with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also our staff see the impact, right? I think we're also able to have very transparent conversations with the staff of, hey, if we can grow X amount this year, we can do two more leader retreats or we can grow the travel budget by however much. Or I think, you know, we're, we're um, we have a track record, right, where people actually can see the impact uh, of, of taking on this work, and I think that, that that's also right, obviously, I think, you know, fundraising is fun in large part because um, you can see the results, right? It's a very concrete thing in a very difficult, complex world. Yeah, actually, a number of people said that, that, that it, as, as much as it can be a kind of getting over the hump for staff to get engaged in fundraising, um, the, ta the tangibleness of it compared to the issues that these organizations are working on and the lifespan of these issues is actually really gratifying and, and can be a really good mix uh, to enter into the culture. It reminds me, Melinda, of you talking about relationships. And I think we also hear that normative stuff that Ruth was talking about of, you know, oh, we're not supposed to ask our friends, or we're not supposed, you know, th th these people are in relationship with the organization, not with me. I don't want to get too attached to me. Tell me a little bit about your philosophy around being in relationship with donors. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, I ask everyone I know. All of y'all will probably get a request from me next week because I'm doing a fundraising campaign. I just, you know, I feel like uh, fundraising is about connecting people you know, sharing um, that part of our work, and giving pe everybody the opportunity to be a part of this work. They can choose whether or not they do or not. I'm not going to make that choice for them. So I don't, I don't decide for someone whether or not they'll be involved or interested in our work. I do a lot of diverse things outside of student action with farm workers. I'm an aerial dancer. I'm a potter. I have some very diverse interests. All of those people get asked to contribute to student action with farm workers because I share with them my day job and how passionate I am about making change for workers. So, you know, I there's no limits. If someone, of course, doesn't want to be involved and, and give, there's no pressure. But I give people the opportunity. And I think um, relationship, people give, we know this, people give to people that they know and they trust and they believe and who ask them. So I ask. If I know you, I ask you. Um, and I think we, you know, sort of foster that with the students when we're training them. We're saying people are going to give because they trust you. They believe in you. They want to support you to get this opportunity, to have this chance to, to do this um, program. And it's a way for them to start practicing telling their story. And a big part of our work is around storytelling, um, telling the individual narratives of farm workers as well as the collective narrative of farm workers. And so we need those young people to practice telling their story. And there's no better way to practice telling your story and then giving that person that you just told an opportunity to be involved because people get moved. People get excited. They want as Ari said, they want to do something. And a quick thing they can do is make a donation right here. So it's just, you know, once you have a good conversation with someone, once you have a relationship with someone, um, oftentimes I don't even have to ask people. They sort of offer it like they want to, you know. So I think the relationship for me is just key, I mean, to, um, to fundraising. And it's not segregated for me. I was meeting with some folks this morning and talking about, I was sharing our model with fundraising with them because they wanted to try to do some online fundraising. And they were asking about, well, how do you do a meeting with someone? And I was like, 
my meetings with donors are not like, I want to meet with you and we're going to ask you for a big gift. I, I mostly meet with donors after they give to thank them. Like after I do a big online fundraising campaign, I connect with every person individually that gave and I say, do you want to meet, to talk, to catch up. So most of my meetings with donors are set after a campaign. People are much more willing to meet with me if they know I'm not asking but thanking. So it's just I get a chance to meet with them, to thank them, to see what's up with their family, with their work, with their new job, and then share in person what's going on with staff and how they want to be involved beyond giving. And that's how we yeah. get volunteers, board members, committee members. Yeah. Really quickly, what percentage of your time would you say as executive director you spend on relationship stewardship, fundraising writ large? Yeah, I probably spend about a third. I probably do about a third fundraising, a third management, and a third program. But again, it's all pretty integrated. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Um, Ari, can you talk a little bit about communications and how you're situating communications and development, especially with your issue and, and how fast moving it is? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, about half of our income comes from major donors, um, and the other half comes from online, um, online donations that are mostly related to time-sensitive, action-oriented campaigns. Um, so we have um, a relatively large email list. We have a pretty substantial social media footprint, for at least for our sector, for, for this movement. Um, so a huge amount of our energy is going into figuring out, you know, Obama said this yesterday, what should we ask people to do about it? And if we, you know, ask them all after that to give 18 bucks, can we buy a billboard to say that thing again? Or, you know, this person in Palestine is asking for help on this issue, and can we tell their story? And if so, can we then ask people to, you know, become members? And from there, you know, so on and so forth. So um, we really, really believe that people are hungry for accurate and interesting and useful information and for stories. Um, that really both explain how terrible things are on the ground in Israel-Palestine right now and also where there are pockets of hope, right? I think that we find that um, it's important to be realistic, right, about, you know, we're, we're in a stage in our movement where the movement is growing quite rapidly and the situation is deteriorating quite rapidly. Um, and our supporters want to know both, both sides of that, right? So I think that we, we actually spend a lot of time and, and re, recently re, reorganized almost our entire staff workflow around trying to figure out what are the top one or two things we want to be saying to people this week, right? How do we want people, what do we want people to know? What do we want people to do? Um, and how can we, we organize that, right, so that we don't, I think, I think especially because we're in a, a pretty heated movement moment, um, we don't want to be telling people, you know, here's 15 horror stories and here's 13, you know, petitions you can sign and, oh, my God, here's another 20 events, right? Like, what's the what's the priority, right? What's the theme? What's the take home? What's the thing you say to your uncle at Passover? You know, like what's the, what's the way to make sense of it all? Um, and so I think we're um, really putting that, I think, forward first, right? And then I think if, if we do that right, then the ask is already made, right? Either, you know, explicitly or implicitly because we're explaining to people, you know, what's going on, what are the stakes and, and where we think a difference can be made. Ruth, I'm looking at time. Do you want to? Do you want to do some? I could keep talking to these guys forever. Um, do you want to? Do you want to do some questions? If you, if you want to do some, a, a couple final questions, that's fine. But I have a huge number of questions that have come from people who are participating. Uh, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Well, before we get into into um, kind of the, the substance of, of what I want to ask you. I've gotten a number of questions just asking people, asking what are the sizes of your organizational budgets? Um, and are you already answered this one, but what proportion is made up of individual donor money? Um, if you could just answer those two questions. And then are, are you kind of networked in chapters or are you Oh, a single centralized organization. If you could just answer those questions first, because they're kind of the structural ones. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go, Melinda? Sure. Um, so, uh, Student Action with Farmer Curse is based in North Carolina, which is, I think is important in terms of resources. We're in the South. We're, most of our work's in the South. We do a little bit of work nationally through National Farmer Awareness Week, but we don't, we are one office 
I'm sitting in it, Durham, North Carolina. We have eight staff, 50 paid students, interns and organizers. Our annual budget's about 700,000 every year. Uh, we have a reserve where we want it. Um, and individual donors, we get about 125,000 of the 700. So JVP is a national organization. We have 65 chapters um, in every region of the country and then five uh, identity or professional based councils. So we have a rabbinical council, an academic council, um, a labor council, an artist council. We have 29 staff. Um, our budget this year is $2.5 million and we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 12,000 individual donors in a given calendar year. Thanks. And I wanted to go back to a couple things that um, you both said. So Ari, um, let's start with you. And I want to ask, you You talked about people really understanding where the money was going to go when they were asking for the money. And that um, implies that there's a level of transparency around budgeting in your organization. Um, could you talk about how that works, how fluid it is, um, you know, how staff tend to be involved in the budgeting of organizations so that they do, in fact, understand where that money, what the uses of that money would be? Yeah, that's a um, really pertinent question right now. I think we're, uh, we, we've grown pretty rapidly over the last couple of years, so we're really um, having to change and develop our systems to maintain even the same level of transparency. Um, I, I think what it boils down to is that we really believe in being responsive. Um, so a large part of our programmatic time and, and a large part of our budget actually is, um, you know, accounted for in, in very general ways at the beginning of the year, but with the knowledge that we will use them when the moment is right, right? So we have, for example, a paid advertising line in our budget that is however many thousand dollars. We don't say, you know, in February, we'll run an ad in Variety because you know the Oscars this year included a trip to Israel, right? Like we we um, put it, we sort of budget in pockets for the types of things we know we're good at, the types of things we think will have an impact, the types of things we know our members and donors care about, um, but then really have um, prioritized doing the plugging in the specifics. Um, when it can be the most impactful, right? So I think that's one way that the the sort of staff. Um, you know, doesn't just get to have a say in it, but actually they're the ones vetting those ideas. They're, they're the ones executing them. They're the ones figuring it out. Um, and for our donors, you know, it's not just about making sure they can see our budget. It's about specifically saying, you know, hey, if we can raise $10,000 by Friday, we can do this cool thing. Um, so I think we really, really believe in budgeting as an intention we set out at the beginning of the year, but not um, the full story, right? And, and it truly is a living document for us. Right. And Melinda, you talked about um, about teaching people, specifically young people, to fundraise. And one of the pieces that I loved most in the report was the emphasis on this being a leadership development activity, particularly for young people of color, for young people in general, and for all young leaders, that doesn't necessarily take them down the road of just being a development person. Um, and it's something that we all need in, in, in leadership capacities as, as we get older. Can you talk a little bit about how explicit you are with that um, and how it kind of works with the overall uh, function of leadership development? Yeah, I mean, we consider ourselves a leadership development organization, which means that we provide a lot of opportunities not only for the young people in our programs, but for staff and board also. We have a lot of young people on our board, a lot of folks who are first-time board members. So the idea of providing opportunities for particularly folks from farm worker families to be successful in the roles that we're asking them in is very important for us. So with all of our programs, we want to create an environment for them to be successful. And for that, you know, for us it means extensive training, it means extensive mentoring and coaching, and it means that all of our programs are paid. Um, so if you're an intern with us, you're going to get paid as well. So I think there's that piece of it of like, let's make sure that financially people can participate, they're not worried about resources and that they receive the training, both philosophical, because we do a lot of training on um, sort of the history of the agricultural 
movement as well as agricultural production in our country. So big picture historical analysis of our view of why farm workers are treated the way they are. Um, and then we do a lot of practical training on how to do grassroots fundraising, how to do public speaking, how to tell your story. Um, we look, work with people on their resumes and cover letters, how to get a job in the movement, how do you talk about this internship in your next role. So we're really trying to build the farm worker movement with young people primarily from farm worker families who have a diversity of um, experiences and training so that you're right, they can plug in. I mean, we all know that there's a dearth of people of color in fundraising, right, in development. There's not a lot of opportunities. It's, and is in director roles. There's a lot of white women in nonprofit director and development roles. We want to make sure that young people, particularly Latinos and other um, folks, uh, other people of color particularly, have are getting some of the training early on so if they want to pursue that, maybe they'll have a better shot so that they have some of that experience. I don't know if that's getting at what you're you're saying. It does. It, it really does. And uh, one more question that comes from me, and I'm going to go to people from the uh, um, from the participants, which is, you know, that there is a very strong emphasis in the report that's that came out of those that were, uh, you know, that were respondents that this is that fundraising is simply a part of organizing for yeah. you and that it integrates well into your conceptions of organizing. Any of the three of you, do you want to talk about that at all? What, you know, kind of what the implications of that finding are for, or, for the way organizations function? <clears throat> you want to go first? Oh, sure. I'll, I, while you guys are, the, while the experts are thinking of the right story, I can say as a generalist, as a, as a researcher on this, that was a, a huge theme. And I think my colleague Marla, who worked on it, said, you know, her takeaway from the whole report is how do groups who don't, aren't literally organizing groups, act like organizers around their issue and their cause. I mean, for her, that's what she took away, that, that you know, fundraising from individuals when it's really done from that place of core identity and, and mission passion, even if that mission is not quite at the edge of, say, advocacy or policy change, it, that mission can still be that galvanizing. And you could still take an organizer's mindset to bringing people into the fold, right? So, I mean, the way organizers do leadership development, the way they do communications, the way they share decision making, the way all of that you can do, it seems to us, or you can attempt to do, even if you're not literally an organizing group. Right. Do either of the rest uh, of the other two of you want to add to that? You know, you know, I think we definitely think about fundraising as a leadership development process, right? The ask, you know, for somebody to go from hundred dollars to thousand dollars is to take more responsibility for the future of this work, and and um, we really, I think, learn a lot from our field team um, in terms of how to do that. I think one of the things that we're also spending some time now thinking about is that, you know, when we say fundraising is organizing, that doesn't mean that there's no difference between a phone bank and a canvas or, you know, a town hall and a newsletter, right? So also, it's okay to do, like, we, we're, I think we're trying to give ourselves permission to figure out, well, what are our strategies um, for fundraising that, and, and that that's okay, right? That it's okay to sometimes ask somebody for money because that's, you know, the right time for them to give, even if it's not the right time, you know, for us to put time into that solicitation or we'll tell a different story in an appeal than we might in a, teaching, right, or, or whatever, right, that it's actually okay to embrace fundraising um, as something that has its own needs and, and creates its own momentum and, and addresses people in a particular way that that's, that's acceptable, right, that's strategic and, and um, is a way to honor and take care of the work as a whole. Right. I have a, a nice, small, provocative question here, which is, is the role of the development director dead? <laughs> <laughs> it depends. <laughs> I think it depends, you know, I think for us it was just, I feel strongly that people organizations should um, have the titles and the job descriptions and the roles that they need to carry out their mission. And for some organizations perhaps that is, you know, is a program director and a finance manager and development director. For other organizations it's five program staff and executive director. I just, I don't feel like we need to be bound by certain 
job descriptions or titles in nonprofits. We need to do, we need to figure out how do we get this mission accomplished? How do we move toward this mission using our values as an organization? And what is the team that we need to do that? Instead of hiring a development director, I guess it's been 10 years ago now, we hired an assistant director. Best decision ever because that person freed up some of my time doing HR stuff, insurances, all the stuff I didn't want to do and wasn't where my energy was and allowed me to spend more time doing the traditional development director role. What do you think, Ari? No. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, it, it's a really useful and exciting role, right? And I think that the, the appropriate place for it, I, I think, is when it's really a time in the organization's life cycle to have one person consolidating all those choices and all that information and all those you know, benchmarks and best practices like in one place, right, in one head or in one, you know, small circle of conversation. And I think that I'm sure there'll come a time again in our life cycle when that's what we need, right? And we, we need to sort of hand that thinking work, that planning work to, you know, one person um, for a long time or a short time, right? But I think that, um, that no, I think I, I really like being a development director. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's a, it's a really wonderful job. <laughs> well, uh, you know, you are you're passionate about the work though I think that is when development directors can can work I mean you obviously know the work of the organization you're passionate about the issues you can talk about that where I've seen it not work is when an outside person who has development experience comes in is not passionate about the organization the mission knows little about the purpose and is brought in because of some contacts I've seen that fail every single time So um, there's a question here about hiring. When you hire staff, um, do you in any way look for a skill set that would imply that they're going to be good fundraisers? So if you're hiring, um, you know, any other position, a completely unrelated position, I don't know what that would be in your organization, are you also looking for skill sets that would help them be good fundraisers? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so all of our hiring is based on a core competencies model, right? So everybody's, there's, a, there's particular ones for each team um, and for each position, but then there's also a, a general one that we're all accountable to trying to, to maintain the, or to, to reach the highest levels of. And those, so those categories include, or those skills include strong verbal communication, having a good attitude, being able to ask for help when you need it, um, right, knowledge of Israel-Palestine. Um, so I think that those when we're hiring somebody for a job that has very little to do with fundraising, um, our core competencies, I think, serve to make sure that that person has the basic skills it takes to say, hey, do you want to put your wallet where your heart is? Right. Yeah, you so we look, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Melinda. We look for transferable skills. So, you know, there's going to be a primary role that that person's going to have to deliver. Um, we look for some alignment with our philosophy. Um, we use the popular education pedagogy, so we ask people if they've got training in that method of educating. We definitely look at relationship, how well do they, can they have a conversation with someone, do they have past experience that shows that they um, can communicate well in different ways. Um, so things that are transferable. We don't need to see that they have done fundraising before. We also have a great pool of alumni that I mean, currently seven of our eight staff are alumni of our program, so they've gone through our training program, so I know what they um, know in terms of fundraising, but once you've got a pool of graduates of your program of, you know, folks who, it's a great pool to then pull from. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, for any number of reasons, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to ask a question that I'm sure is occurring, and this will be the last question for you guys, and then I'll let Jean make a small statement. We'll get out of here. But, but uh, this is an important question, I think, for a lot of people on the line. If you are not already here, if you do not already have this mindset that um, this responsibility is with all of us, and in fact you have development isolated in one office of two people or one office of one people, one person, and um, how is it, how can you develop this culture 
of a shared responsibility that you guys are talking about. And I'd like to hear from all three of you on this. Uh, Jean first. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say Jean first? Yes. Thank you, Ruth. Um, well, I mean, that's the $10 million question, right? I, the, the, the truth is that most of these organizations have something pretty substantial in their DNA around, in, in their, you know, born, uh, born with. Um, now, that's not to make it seem easy, though, but either because other funding wasn't available for their issue when they were founded or they wanted to be um, substantially independent of uh, certain kinds of institutional funding, you do see across these groups a tendency, although like Melinda is a good example, a very diverse business model, um, but there, there is a tendency to have been kind of founded with this orientation that, that we're going to be in relationship with individual people. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think the big distinguishing characteristic is not so much how much money they do or don't raise from individuals, but how they view their organization in relationship to people outside it, right? And, and that's the thing, that's where I would start is sort of to get outside of the head of the organization. The, the, the hypothetical organization you described is a very insular organization. It's an organization that's primarily concerned with its own structure and its own practices. And what these groups are in much more in relationship, whether it's Melinda's 50 students or Ari's 50 chapters, their, their gaze is outward. Right? And so they're much more influenced by who, who they're in support of and who they're working with than by their own internal notions right. of how things should be. And I think that's really the ingredient, is to get out of your office, <laughs> you know, get off your org chart, and get engaged with community and let it go from there. Excellent. Melinda? Um, yeah, I think the thing I would add is just um, I think we have always uh, been constituent-based and had a have a, had a goal of being a constituent-led organization. We did not start out that way. Um, and yeah, I did a workshop yesterday yeah. talking about how about equity within our organization. And I shared that it took us 10 years as an organization to move from a majority white organization to a majority organization led board and staff by people of color. And it was an intentional move, and it was from this concept of constituent base. And if you have a constituent-based interest, philosophy, then that means the folks that are affected by your organization need to be involved with the whole thing. So for us, you know, it really means asking a student from a farm worker family whose family makes $17,000 a year to make a financial contribution to fund the work, to fund the movement, to own the work. Um, and without, without apologies. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, how about you? I, I think very briefly, I mean, I think one is just to say I, I stand in awe of those attempting that transition because I think it is, it is really hard to jump tracks in a fundraising model, right? And I think that um, you can't just stop writing a grant report and start building an individual donor base and like that, it's a very difficult thing. I guess it can be done, but it's it's hard. And I think that that's so what it really is. I think that the thing that Jean and and Melinda both said in in different ways is you you have to find the need for it, right? And I think then figure out a way that the organization as a whole, you know, if that need isn't a financial crisis or that need isn't, you know, it, it has to be more than just oh, wouldn't that be cool or oh, that's what this report says to do, right? I think that like it has to be um, organization. You know, we're all we're all busy, we're all overworked, right? Like we can only do what we need to do. Um, so I think that identifying what that is and figuring out what are gonna be the structures that, that make that need something that you can be accountable to. Um, that's, that's where it is. I yeah. do, um, I, I do wanna remind people, did you wanna say something before we end, Jean? Um, I wanna say, uh, thank you again to Kim Klein and Stephanie Roth. I mean, I think we all know that this work is not a departure from what they have been teaching uh, and, and how they've been relating to fundraising for 30 plus years. Um, I just did a panel with Kim last night and I know that she would say though that this report did move her in some ways and in particular, uh, you know, not radical shift at all, but uh, it moved her a lot towards this issue of identity and, and starting with identity and culture and not 
skipping to the plan, uh, which is you know often what consultants are hired to do, including her, and, and really starting with organizational philosophy and identity and not giving that short shrift. So I wanted to say that because I think that's what she would say if she was closing out here. <laughs> I think that is absolutely true. And I do want to I want to close out here by saying that the surest way of um, of making you know of of including in your thinking about revenue um, what who's directing you the surest way of getting to your constituents directing you is to establish a really broad base of supporters and some of them may not be large supporters some of them may be small supporters but that constant communication with people who support the work that you're doing is not only rich in terms of you know the the cash treasure that might come to you but it's rich in terms of feedback to the organization and ideas about how to move forward there's so many things that you get out of this kind of, of um, structure and it's one of the reasons why I'm such a huge fan of this report but as all of these wonderful panelists have said um, you know you have to actually declare yourself um, as, as Melinda talked about say you know we we need to change we need to be something we may not be right now and then set that track for yourself to make this work. And fundraising may not be the first step that you take. It may be a bigger declaration about who you're responsible to um, and how to build a base of support that also includes the cash that you need. So I want to thank you all again for participating in this. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. And Jean, as usual, wonderful, wonderful research. Um, very grounded and very resonant. And thank all of the participants for coming. You will all get um, not only a link to the report, but also um, slides and the presentation. So um, we'll get that to you within 48 hours and probably a lot sooner than that. And feel free to send us any additional questions. We'll get them along to um, the, re the report's authors so that they can think about them as they move along. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Melinda. Thank you, Ari. Hi, guys. Hi. Nice to meet you.